Okay, this is Thomas Freed with an IRSZoom.com special. I thought today what I'd do is go through and show how the IRS defrauds both the court and defendants in all civil and criminal tax trials regarding federal personal income tax. This is how they defraud the court. This is how they defraud the citizens. This is what they do for all tax enforcement operations for non-filers. This is for people, what they do to non-filers. So why don't we start with, uh, we're going to run through some documents in the statutes. Let's just get right into it. This is how the IRS defrauds the American people regularly. We look at Title 26, Section 6201, the assessment authority. In order to claim that you owe tax, the IRS has to perform an assessment. You can see here the authority of secretary. Secretary is authorized and required to make the inquiries, determinations, and assessments of all taxes imposed by this title or accruing under any former internal revenue which have not been duly paid by stamp at the time and in the manner provided by law. Oh, well, income taxes aren't paid by stamp, so they can't assess them there, can they? Such authority shall extend to and include the following taxes shown on return and two unpaid taxes payable by stamp. So we see that the IRS, in order to perform an assessment, needs to have a tax return. That's why they want you to voluntarily file one. They can only assess alcohol, tobacco, and firearm taxes under this assessment authority, which have not been duly paid by stamp. That's alcohol and tobacco taxes. They're paid by stamp. This is an ATF assessment authority. That's why they want you to file the return. So you file the return or they have to do it for you. Now, this is what they do is because they have to file a return, they bring forward in court this account transcript. Here's the whole document. This is just the first page. There's not a whole lot of importance on this first page. We can see that the account is based on a form 1040. This one's from 2005. They got the taxpayer identification number and then not much useful information on the front page. So we go to the next page. Now this is page two of the account transcript. And it lists the transactions that have been posted against this particular account transcript. And you can see here, the very first transaction is this code 150 substitute tax return prepared by the IRS with a date of 10-16-2006 in a zero amount. Now, this is always the first transaction because they have to have a tax return in order to have an account. The tax return up here, the form 1040, shows that the 1040 is the account. But this, this one, DD-150 says the IRS prepared a substitute for return on 10-16-2006. Now, there's something interesting here. On with this Code 420 examination and tax return on 10 2006 Now, that's 11 days before the substitute for return was filed. And the reason why they had to do a substitute was because the individual wouldn't file one. So they had to claim they could do the substitute for return authority. But how did they examine a return 11 days before a return was created? And you see the next thing that happens is it goes right to an examination and then they close out the examination down here. So they're saying they did a substitute for return. And this is interesting, a zero return. I thought zero returns were frivolous. If the citizens file a zero return, the IRS rejects it and says it's frivolous. They can't use it. But look at how they start an account transcript for a non-filer. This is every single tax year for a non-filer, for every non-filer in the year. They start it with a zero return. Now, how did they know to put on anything on the examination, the extra items? Didn't they have them when they prepared the zero return? What? One month before, 10, 16, 11, 26, 31 days later, they had all the information for the examination, but they didn't have any of it to put on the return? Nonsense. Of course they had it on the return. So why did they, they had it to put it on? Why didn't they since they had it? We know they had it. They had the W-2s, the 1099s. It's right here. They put them on 31 days later. So why didn't they put them up here? 
Well, if any amount were calculated here, somebody might want to see the return to see how the amount was calculated. And of course, they don't want to do that because this document, this is fraud by computer fraud. This DD-150, this does not exist. This is a non-existent document. This is how they defraud their computer. Let's take a look. They have to have the substitute for return because they can't examine a person or a bank or an institution or a W-2 or a 1099. They can only examine a tax return. The tax return is the account. Form 1040, set it on the first page. They have to have a return, so if you won't do it, they poke in this DD-150, which tells the computer a return has been done. And then the computer kicks it to the examination division, and they add on the W-2 and the 1099s and send you a notice of deficiency. Okay, so let's look at 6020B, returns prepared for or executed. This is the substitute for return authority. 6020A is a paragraph that applies to when the individual agrees to consent to disclose information and work with the secretary. They work together, they fill out the return, and then when the taxpayer signs the return, it may be received by the secretary as the return of such person. It has to be paid. It has to be signed. It has to be signed. The return has to be signed. Now, when the when the individual won't work with the secretary, then 6020B takes over, execution of return by secretary. If any person fails to make any return required by any internal revenue law or regulation made thereunder at the time prescribed therefore, or makes willfully or otherwise a false or fraudulent return, the secretary shall make such return from his own knowledge and from such information as he can obtain through testimony or otherwise. Well, there it is. Their secretary is the one who fails a requirement to make a return if there is one, because this is the only authority in law that requires someone to make a return, is that of the secretary. And the secretary, it says, is to make it from his knowledge, from such information, like the W-2s and the 1099. So why didn't he use them and put them on? We're coming to that. And down here, the most important status of returns any return so made and subscribed by the secretary shall be prima facie good and sufficient for all legal purposes. Now, prima facie good and sufficient for all legal purposes means sufficient as evidence in court of an assessment. Prima facie is first look. Uh, stands sufficient as the primary evidence of an assessment has been performed under 6020B. It's the subscribed the return. You sign the return, you've made an assessment. So let's go down. Now this is what they try to substitute in place of, this is what they try to substitute in place of an actual tax return. They bring in this form 4549, income tax discrepancy adjustments. You can see it relates to a form 1040 up here. This is for the same year, 2005. It lists the numbers that they have on the computer from the W-2s and the 1099s. It goes on for a couple of pages and comes down here to the bottom where you get a signature and a date. But notice that date is different from the date on the account transcript. Remember, the date of the SFR was 10-16. 2006, the date of the examination was 11, 2007. So obviously they held this examination report for seven months before they posted it to the computer. This is done 426. And the substitute for return, as you remember, was done on 1016. So the substitute return is done 1016. On 426, they did an examination. They posted the results on 1126. But you can see you got three different dates 1016, 426, and 1126. So obviously, this SFR, this document, is not the examination document. It's a separate document. The dates are different. It has to be. So here we are in the 4549. There's the date on the 4549. It's in 2007. It's a different document than the SFR, but the statute says that only the subscribed tax return 
is prima facie good and sufficient for all legal purposes. That means this form 4549 is not prima facie good and sufficient for all legal purposes. This isn't good enough. You have to produce the actual return. This is a fraudulent substitution. And you can see this form 4549 relates to a form 1040. Well, okay, where is it? You should also notice there's no OMB document control number on this, which means it's not a form they're allowed to collect information from the American people with. And as such, it can't possibly be a tax return. This is an internal examination worksheet of the IRS, and it is not good and sufficient for all legal purposes as evidence of an assessment in court. And this is what they produce. It's a fraudulent substitution. Now, this is what they also produce with it. This is the supposedly certificate of official record. This is the 6020B certification record they're trying to substitute for an actual tax return. Let's see what it says. I certify that the annexed is an exact transcript from the transcript delivery system for the account of SSN in respect to the U.S. individual income test. So he's swearing this is a computer printout. Big deal. All assessments, penalties, interest, abatements, credits, and refunds relating thereto is disclosed by that record to this office as of this date appearing on said certificate are shown therein. I further certify that I have legal custody of certain federal tax returns. That's a lie. Transcripts of accounts and other accounting records established and maintained. So what they're doing is they're substituting the 4549 in this certification. Oh, this is all certified. It's an exact account replica, but it's not a tax return. And a statute requires a signed tax return as evidence of an assessment. This is all fraudulent substitution. Why are they fraudulently substituting the 4549 in the certificate with the gold seal? Oh, look, the gold seal. It must be so official. Oh, yeah, absolutely. That gold seal just does it for me. I believe you, lying piece of shit. This is a fraudulent transaction. What goes next? Oh, this is IR Revenue Ruling 2005-59, handed down in 2005. And the question addressed inside this Revenue Ruling is, are documents made by the Internal Revenue Service as authorized under Section 6020B of the Internal Revenue Code joint returns of income tax for the husband and the wife? And I'm not going to waste your time with the whole thing. Let's just move down. We'll examine the basic of the law in general. A document filed with the service is treated as a return if the document, one, contains sufficient data to calculate the tax liability, two, purports to be a return, three, represents an honest and reasonable attempt to satisfy the requirements of the tax law, and four, is executed under penalties of perjury. Now, that Form 4549 fails two of these tests. It does not purport to be a return. It's an examination worksheet. And it is not signed under penalty of perjury, which means it cannot be accepted as a tax return. Okay, now we move down. So here's another. Section 65, 6065 requires that a return shall contain or be verified by a written declaration that it is made under the penalties of perjury. So that's one of the primary requirements for having a valid tax return. It has to be signed under penalty of perjury. Okay, let's move down. So here we come to the holdings and it says documents made under authority of 6020B that are not signed by the taxpayers are not returns filed by the taxpayers. And down here, issue three, issue two deals with 6020A voluntarily working together. Issue three of Form 870, which includes a waiver signed by the taxpayers, is not a return filed by the taxpayers for the purposes of Section 6013 and does not constitute a valid election to file a joint return. This holding also applies to Form 1902, Report of Individual Income Tax Audit Changes, and Form 4549. Income tax examination changes in any successor forms to these forms. 4549 is by revenue ruling not a valid tax return. Now they have not produced any prima facie good and sufficient evidence of an assessment by producing a 4549 in place of the actual return document allegedly created through the DD 150 SFR created by the IRS for you transaction. So what's going on? Well, anyway, the effect on other documents. 
Revenue ruling 74203 is revoked. A Form 870 signed by taxpayers, husband and wife, is not a return under 6020A, and it is not an election to file a joint return under Section 6013. This holding applies to Form 1902, Report of Individual Income Tax Audit Changes, and Form 4549, Income Tax Examination Changes, and any successor forms to these forms, because these documents do not purport to be returns and do not contain a jurat with a penalty of perjury clause. So there you have it. The 4549 is not a tax return document. It's rejected by law. IR Revenue Ruling says these are not tax returns. And the statute, 6020B, says only the subscribed return is prima facie good and sufficient in court. So they're fraudulently substituting these examination worksheets for the requirement to produce a substitute for return that they've executed, prepared, and signed, subscribed. Why are they doing this? Why won't they produce the return? Well, let's take a look. This letter is from the GAO to senator daniel moynihan when he was the ranking minority member on the committee on finance in the united states senate the subject was the internal revenue service preparing substitute returns for individuals and this reads let's read a little bit of it let's see if we can get this on november 22nd we briefed your office I'm gonna pull it in. On November 22nd, we briefed your office about the substitute for return program at the Internal Revenue Service in accordance with statutory authority granted to the Secretary of the Treasury and his designees. IRS prepares a substitute for return for individuals who do not appear to have filed a required tax return, i.e., potential non-filers. IRS prepares these substitute for returns using information maintained in IRS computer files. Well, as we've seen, no, they don't. They just put a zero there. They intentionally do not use the information in the computer system. So right out of the gate, they're lying. They don't use the information. They just stick a dummy zero return out there that doesn't use any of the information. They wait for the examination to stick on the, on the information. Well, let's keep reading. This letter summarizes the points we made at the briefing. I don't need any more of that. Results in brief. In brief, IRS believes that potential non-filers who receive a substitute for return will be encouraged to respond by either filing a more accurate return or showing that they have no filing requirement. IRS is to give the potential non-filers up to two chances to respond to information showing the proposed amount of the substitute for return. If these individuals do not respond, IRS is to assess the tax shown on the substitute for return and seek payment of the balance due through its regular collection process. Okay, now, where is that in the law? That they just post two numbers and send it to you and give you two chances to pay. The assessment says they have to produce a return. So they're cheating the process. Now we go on agency comments. We requested comments on a draft of this letter from the Commissioner of Internal Revenue or his designee. On February 9, 2000, we received comments from responsible IRS officials in the Examination and Customer Service Divisions. Although the Examination Division said it had no comments, Customer Service Division officials commented on the phrase, substitute for return. They asked us to emphasize that even though the program is commonly referred to as the SFR program, no actual tax return is prepared. No actual tax return is prepared. Instead, these officials noted that IRS prepares a document that substitutes for the return and that proposes an assessment, which is posted to the taxpayer's account and is subject to the collection process. We added a footnote to the letter to explain this and provides references in the draft to clarify this point. So under what statutory authority is a proposed assessment number simply posted to the taxpayer's account without a subscribed signature? This is an admission right here. No actual tax return is prepared. Well, if no actual tax return is prepared, how is anything subscribed? And if nothing was subscribed because no return actually exists, who defrauded the IRS computer by entering that DD150 transaction? 
That 150 transaction is fraud by computer fraud. That's the mechanism the IRS uses to try and force non-filers back into compliance because there is no law requiring you to file. So they have to defraud their own computer with a frivolous zero return to trigger an examination of a non-existent unsigned return and there never is any prima facie good and sufficient for all legal purposes no evidence prima facie good and sufficient to use in court of any assessment because all this 4549 substitution is complete and total fraud there is no tax return to examine they defraud their computer because they have to have a tax return in order to examine anything the account the return Without the return, there's nothing to examine, and they can't assess the tax because it's not paid by alcohol, it's not paid by stamp, as are alcohol and tobacco taxes. So this is the fraud that they engage in. They intentionally defraud their own computer up here with the DD-150 entry on the... This right here is the fraud. Here's the DD-150 substitute tax return prepared by this document does not exist. It was never created on this state. There's no amount because they don't want to have to produce nothing to show there is no document. They figure if it's zero, nobody will ever want to see it because who would want to see how zero was calculated? There's nothing to look at. So they put zero to discourage you from asking for it. When you ask for it, they produce the examination, but not the return because they don't have this. This is fraud by computer fraud. No document was created. No document was signed. They admit it in the GAO letter to send them one, and it's been going on for over 30 years. This is how they do it. It's all fraud by computer fraud. Okay, and why do they have to do it this way? Well, here we are at the end of the letter. Let's move down and look at the next document. This is from the Internal Revenue Manual, and this is the refusal to file IRS 6020B assessment procedure. Uh, you can see this is the assessment procedure. Oh, let's read it right up here. Well, that summons follow up 5290. This is chapter 5200, section 5290 through 91. Refusal to file IRC 6020B assessment procedure. 5291 scope. The procedure applies to employment, excise, and partnership tax returns. What kind? Employment, excise, and partnership? I mean, it doesn't apply to personal income tax returns? Generally, the following returns will be involved. Form 940, Employer's Annual Federal Unemployment. Form 941, Employer's Quarterly Federal Tax Return. Form 942, Employer's Quarterly Tax Return for Household Employees. Form 943, Employer's Annual Tax Return for Agricultural Employees. Form 11B, Special Tax Return Gaming Devices. Form 720, Quarterly Federal Excise Return. Form 2290, Federal Use Tax Return, Form CT1, Employer's Annual Railroad Retirement Tax Return, and Form 1065, U.S. Partnership Return. You get that? You get that? 940, 941, 942, 943, 11B, 720, under this procedure. That's why they have to defraud the computer. They're not allowed to use a Form 1040. So they just stick a DD-150 in there to lie to the computer to trigger an examination of a non-existent account that they fraudulently engineered the manufacturer of by posting fraudulent data to the computer through their transaction records system. And that fraudulent tran that transaction triggers the examination, which sicks the examination division in the government on you. It's not authorized as a form into the Internal Revenue Manual telling the agents the procedure and the scope of authority exercised under this code section, 6020B. Uh, substitute for Return Assessment Authority. Is there any further evidence something's wrong? Well, why don't we look at the next document? Here it is. 
the delegation order, this is for the Oklahoma City District, but that doesn't matter where it's for because the law has to be exactly the same in all 50 states. If it's this in Oklahoma, it has to be this in Pennsylvania, Virginia, New York, California, Arizona, Colorado, Montana, South Dakota, Illinois, Kentucky, West Virginia, Florida, Texas. It has to be the same in every single state. It can't be one set of forms in one state and a different set in another. It has to be exactly the same to preserve geographical uniformity, which is a requirement in the application of the tax system by the government. Now, this is delegation order, authority to execute returns. Under 6020B, it says right here, authority is redelegated. Let's go up. Authority is redelegated the revenue officers GS9 and above to prepare and execute the following returns on behalf of the district director under 6020, section 6020B of the Internal Revenue Code, which is where they have to subscribe it in order for it to be prima facie good and sufficient for all legal purposes. In what forms? 940, 941, 942, 943, 11B, 720, 2290, CT1, and 1065. It's the exact same list as was in the Internal Revenue Manual. There it is in the Internal Revenue Manual. 940, 941, 942, 943, and here it is being delegated. To GS9 and above inside the delegation order, authority to execute. The authority may not be redelegated. This order supersedes the previous version of it. And it references delegation number 182, which authorizes GS9 and above to prepare returns under 6020B without listing the returns authorized. The sub delegation order lists the returns that the people authorized in 182 are allowed to do. So GS9 and above are the groups of people listed in 182. I could show that to you, but it's not really worth it. There isn't anything there. Now, what return is required to be filed? Because maybe this has something to do with why 1040 isn't authorized under 6020B for use by the Internal Revenue Manual. This is Code of Reg Title 26, Code of Federal Regulations, Part 602, OMB Control Numbers under the Paperwork Reduction Act. And under this code section, this law, it was enacted in 1980. And it took well, all the other government agencies, well, basically what the paperwork, what happened with the Paperwork Reduction Act is in the late 70s, the government discovered it was collecting tons of information that it didn't really need. The law didn't require it, they shouldn't be collecting it, and collecting it was creating problems in terms of storage and issues of potential liability for exposure of the unnecessary information to outside parties. So they wrote the Paperwork Reduction Act, which says we're no longer going to collect information that's not required by the law. And under the act, every single department and agency of the government was required to send in all of the forms they used to collect information from the citizens cross-reference to a list of the statutes that required the form or the information on it. OMB took the forms in the cross-reference cross, cross list of statutes, went through it all for every agency and every department, and verified that the only thing, only information on the forms being collected was information in the law that was required to be collected. And if it wasn't there, they eliminated it. And then they created this table, Title 26, Sec. CFR, Section 602.101, where you can go to look up for any law what form is required by law by that law. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to go look up under the Paperwork Reduction Act what form is required by law according to the government. So here you have the code section that imposes the tax. That's part, sec, part one, chapter one, section one, 1. 1.1. Part one, chapter one. Section 1. That's the code section that imposes the federal income tax, the tax on taxable income. And over here on the right side, you can see the OMB document control number, which is the unique OMB document control number assigned to the form or information collection request by OMB upon its completion of the review to make sure that nothing was being collected that wasn't required by law to be collected and that they got everything that was required without getting anything that wasn't. 
So over here on the right, you can see the OMB document control number that's assigned to the form that's required by the code section that imposes the tax. Now you should notice down here for one of the other code sections that if there's more than one form required, it will be listed right there. You can see 123T had multiple listings. I didn't show the third one there, but there's more than one. You can see the second. And for the code section that imposes the tax, there's just one form. And it bears the OMB document control number of 1545-0067. And it's the only form listed for code section one that's required by law. So if form 1040 is the form that's required by law by the code section that imposes the tax, that OMB document control number, 1545-0067, maybe we should highlight that, huh? Can we highlight that? No, that's the wrong one. Okay, so the only form listed is 1545-0067. This number doesn't match. Here you go. Here's the form 1040. This is from 1993. Here's the OMB document control number, 1545-0074. Doesn't match. The number is 0067. Doesn't match. What's the right number? Oh, look. Here it is. Form 2555, foreign earned income. And the number 1545-0067. That matches, 0067. And who's supposed to file this form? For use by U.S. citizens and resident aliens only. Use by U.S. citizens and resident aliens only. Now, that should be highlighted. Why isn't that highlighted? Good enough. So the form that's required by the tax imposed is foreign earned income. And if you remember, I told you before in other videos that the income tax was originally imposed by the Underwood-Simmons Tariff Act of October 3rd, 1913. A tariff is a tax on foreign activity, it's one form of an impost, which is the power to tax foreign persons, foreign activity, foreign imports, and in foreign places. And sure enough, just as we found that the only persons, the withholding agents, the income tax collectors are allowed to collect tax from are foreign persons, we find out that the only income the citizen is required to report is foreign earned income earned in territories and possessions or in a foreign country under tax treaty, which is what this would report. And as you know, I've shown you the 1939 law that reflects this as a tax only in the territories and the possessions. Maybe we should look at that real quick. Where is that? Let's see if we can't find that. 1939. Open it up. Here we go. The night statutes at large for 1939. Here's the proof it was always an indirect tax. And here we go right here. Special classes of taxpayers, estates and trusts, A, memberships of partners, insurance companies, D, non-resident alien individuals, it's collected by withholding agents, foreign corporations, individual citizens of any possession of the United States, foreign earned income, Form 2555, and individual citizens of the United States satisfying the conditions of Section 251 by reason of deriving a large portion of the gross income from sources within a possession of the United States, territories and possessions, Form 2555, foreign earned income. And here's the rest of it, China Trade Act, foreign personal hold companies, mutual investment companies, and that's it. It was enforced under the Underwood-Simmons Tariff Act. It's an impost. It taxes foreign activity, and it doesn't go after. What happened to the other? Did I close that? Uh, our fraud. Okay, here we are. Form 2555. And here's the form. 
0067. Here's the whole form. Look at this. Uh, Okay, here's the whole form 1040. Here's the whole form 2555. You can see up here the OMB document control number. And we can go down to the 1920, the 2023 form. Here's the 1040 from 2023, 1545-0074. Doesn't match the number shown in the table. Now, in the year 2000, when this information started defeating the federal government in courtrooms and in front of juries, the government decided to hide the information. So they removed this entry, 1545 Desert, they removed it. There's no longer. Now, if you try to look up what forms required by Section 1, the law says nothing is owed. There's nothing listed. But they didn't change the law. They just hid the real entry. They removed the entry without Congress changing the law to justify a change in the form required. They didn't want people to know that foreign earned income is the form that's required. And in conjunction with removing the entry, they broke their own rules for each form having its, a unique OMB document control number assigned to it. They assigned the 1545-0074 number to the 2555. So now both forms carry the same OMB document control number, which violates the grounds for the, the principle for the whole system. Each form has to be able to tell what's required from the statute. And by giving two forms the same number, they obscure the true requirement. Now, for the last 24 years, I've been waiting for the other shoe to drop and them to put the number back in with the 0074 as the requirement, but they've never done it. So it's confusing now, but not if you have access to these historical documents that show you that 2555 was 0067. That is what was required in the 1994 law up until the year 2000. It was searchable and you could find it. After 2000, you can't find the entry because they removed it from the code, but they didn't change the law. So it's still in effect. It's just being hidden from you. How do we know? But there's no requirement to file a Form 1040 still? Why don't we go down to our last document? This is from the National Archives. And the director of the federal has asked me to respond to your inquiry. You have asked whether Internal Revenue Service provisions codified at 6020, 6201, 6203. These are the assessment statutes. 6303, 6321, 6330, 20, these are lean and levy through 6343, 6601, 6602, et cetera, have been processed or included. Implementing regulations for the section cited above have been published in various parts of Title 27 of the Code of Federal Regulations. There are no corresponding entries for Title 26. It's all alcohol, tobacco, and firearms, people. It's all alcohol, tobacco, and firearms. That's what this says. Parallel tape of authority, Title 27. Now we go down a little bit lower. The truth is in the Federal Register. We come down here to the bottom. And we see... Our records indicate that the Internal Revenue Service has not incorporated by reference in the Federal Register, as that term is defined in the Federal Register system, a requirement to make an income tax return. So they admit in the Federal Register there's no requirement to make a tax return. We want to get out of this dynamic. To, uh, Oh. Here to fit page. Okay, now I'll go up to the top. So we got the assessment authority 6201, which requires a tax return. The account transcript is based on the tax return. 
and it uses a fraudulent DD-150 entry to start the account transcript to trigger an examination of what should have been done on the return, but wasn't because they don't actually re pr produce or create a return. They just lie to the computer. 6020B says you have to actually have the return. It has to be signed to be evidence good and sufficient for all legal purposes. That means in court. The 4549 is substituted for the tax return fraudulently. This is the examination worksheet. It's not a tax return, and it's not signed under penalty of perjury. So this is a fraudulent substitution for the DDS-150, the SFR, that's supposed to exist and be signed. The whole substitute for return non-filer program is fraud, is conducted by fraud on computer fraud based on fraud by computer fraud. That's how they do it. They defraud the computer about the existence of a non-existent return, which they then claim they examine and substitute the examination results. And that gold seal certificate that make you think that what's happening is legal when really it's all criminal fraud. And here's the certificate, the big gold seal. Oh, I swear, the computer printed everything just the way it is in the computer. Yeah, but nobody ever signed a tax return, you lying piece of shit. So here you have revenue rule in 2005-59. You need to be returned, purport to be a return. It has to be signed. And Form 4549s are not tax returns. They are not prima facie good and sufficient in court. They cannot be substituted lawfully. The whole thing is a criminal fraud. And here's the GAO letter that admits we never create a return. We just defraud the computer and tell it we have. And they push a few pieces of paper around so that we can make it look real official. And actually, they're engaged in a criminal conspiracy of fraud by computer fraud to extort money from citizens under the guise and pretense of taxation. Because, of course, none of the money ends up in the Treasury. It all goes to the private corporation of the Federal Reserve Bank. It's not a tax system at all. It's a peonage debt service system. And this is how they compel Americans into the role of involuntary servitude through fraud and computer fraud to compel non-filers to service the $35 trillion in debt Congress has unconstitutionally run up to the Federal Reserve Bank who never put a dime never put a dime of their own money into the system. How'd they lend $35 trillion when they didn't have a dime? The whole thing is fraud. Oh, we just post it to the account and hope they pay it. Form 1040 is not allowed to be used under the Internal Revenue Manual for 6020B. It's not allowed to be used under the delegation orders authorizing the GS-9 and above officers to do substitute for returns under 6020B. And it's not a form required by law, according to the OMB document control numbers posted in the Paperwork Reduction Act that existed in the law from 1986 to the year 2000 when they removed this information to hide the true nature of the requirement from the American people and to prevent them from being able to use it in the law to defeat the government in jury trials, both civil and criminal. And here's the form with the OMB document control number, and here's the form with the wrong number that's not required, and here's the letter from the National Archives that says there's no requirement to file a return. It doesn't exist because there's no Form 1040 that is required. Now, this is the fraud that the IRS commits to deceive people into believing they've created a substitute for return when they have, in fact, not. All they've done is use computer fraud to defraud the computer to start an automated process, the examination of the account transcript with its first transaction, which examination cannot occur cannot occur without the tax return to examine. And again, how they examine a return 11 days before it's created, well, that's one on me.
I, I don't know what this is for. Every single other date on this is chronological because it has to go in order. Did this, do this. Each thing is dependent upon the other steps, except for this one, which is out of order. It's not first. And somehow they managed to examine a tax return before they ever created it. Because this individual would prepare no returns for them. So that's a little bit odd. <laughs> And 6020B, again, you have to sign it. Any return so made and subscribed by the secretary or her delegate, GS9 or above, shall be prima facie good and sufficient for all legal. No other document is prima facie good and sufficient. No other document. And this is how they're defrauding the American people about what's going on with the uh, substitute for returns and the substitute for return program. The whole thing is a complete and total fraud. And... This is how you can expose it in court. Scale this down to 50. This is how you defeat it in court. Is you can your account transcript will look just like this. Now you can compare these dates, right? You got the, I told you the date on the examination doesn't match. Let's look at Here's the date on the on, on the certification, November 6, 2023. That's 17 years after the SFR. Where's the SFR? Did you lose it? If you don't have the SFR 20, 17 years later, you got no evidence in court of any tax being owed, and you can't substitute something else. Produce the SFR instead of this nonsense with the gold seal on it. Oh, I'm so impressed. The gold seal makes it official. They're definitely not lying. They definitely are lying. Anytime they put this nonsense on there, that's a sign they're probably lying about it. Oh, you don't have to read the law. Just believe the gold seal. Everything is, oh, honest. Yeah, you lying piece of shit. Talk to me about it. Show me the document, you pig. Can't do it. Doesn't exist. It's all fraud by computer fraud. The whole tax system is fraudulent. We don't have a tax system. It's a peonage debt service system. The sooner the rest of you wake up to this reality, the sooner we'll be able to fix the class warfare tearing this nation apart, which is based in the class legislation of the income tax system, which literally uses the brackets of the tax system to define the classes that will be set at warfare with one another through the implementation of different laws for the different classes. Oh, isn't that sweet? It's no longer one law for everyone. It's different laws for the poor, for the rich, for the black, for the white, for the Jewish, for the Catholic. For the Trump, different laws for different groups. And it all starts with the income tax, and it's all unconstitutional. It's all fraudulent communism. This is where it comes from. Communism, the second plank of the Communist Manifesto, a heavy, progressive, or graduated income tax. That's where you find graduated taxation, non-uniform. Break the people into classes, treat them differently, and take more from some and less from others by the votes of the mass impoverished and punish the wealthy who won't support the political agenda being pushed by the current administration. It's communism, class legislation. The income tax as a graduated tax system is class legislation. It's unconstitutional. And the Supreme Court wrote it all up in 1896 as being unconstitutional. I've shown that before in other videos. So, there you have it. They have to have a return because it's not paid by stamp. And they just have to have a signed return to be prima facie good and sufficient. And they don't produce a return. They produce this nonsense, an internal examination worksheet that purports to relate to a Form 1040, but somehow never manages to show up with the Form 1040. It only shows up by itself to take the place of the required return. And yeah, it's signed, but there's no penalty of perjury here. And this is just a printout of what's in the computer again. It's not a tax return, and it doesn't purport to be one.
So this is all fraud by computer fraud. That's how they're operating. The Internal Revenue, Man Re Internal Revenue Ruling says the Form 4549s aren't tax returns, and the judges don't care anything at all about the law. They're just there to enforce the de facto system. If you made money, you pay. And the judges have become the criminal enterprise running a racketeering operation from the bench. Courts are racketeering the American people by fraud and computer fraud to compel them into this system of involuntary servitude to keep servicing the $35 trillion in debt run up by Congress and owed to the Federal Reserve Bank, which is where all your so-called tax dollars go, to the Federal Reserve Bank, not the U.S. Treasury. And what that means, of course, is that what that means, of course, is that when Congress needs, when there's a disaster, no tax return is prepared. What this means is that when there's an earthquake in California or a flood in New Orleans, Congress runs to the Treasury to draw on the revenues that have been accumulating there from the tax collections all year long. They're going to get a billion dollars out and give it to FEMA to go help the emergency victims. So they run to the Treasury and to draw on the tax revenues accumulating there. And what do they find? There's nothing there. The revenues haven't been accumulating. They're not deposited in the Treasury. There's no money in the Treasury to draw on to give to FEMA. So what do they have to do? That's right, borrow another trillion from the Federal Reserve Bank who stole the tax revenues they should have been able to rely on and utilize. But because there's no tax accumulating in the Treasury, they have to borrow another trillion. And now the number's 35, 36, 37, 38, 40, 45, 50. As goes the currency, so goes the fate of the nation and your future, and your children's future, too. It all ends with the class legislation of the income tax, which turns you into a ruled people, not a represented population. A ruled people, ruled by extortion, fear, fraud, computer fraud, and criminal theft by the men who were supposed to be upholding the law and watching out for the rights of the American people, the federal judges. Federal judges are the one doing this to you, destroying America and enslaving the American people in the name of tax only, under color of law, under color of office, under the guise and pretense of income taxation. It's not taxation, people. It's enslavement. It's fraud. It's the end of freedom in America if we don't rein it in and stop this nonsense. They're winding down to the end game. America is divided 50 50. Either you get rid of the divisions in the law, reunite the people, and allow for a unified representation again, which we really haven't had since the Civil War, or we're going to be destroyed as a nation as our house's currency is completely rendered worthless and printed into oblivion. As goes the currency, so goes the fate of the nation. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap that up on that note. If you want more, you want to get over to taxfreedom.com and start reading. If you need help answering anything you've received from the IRS, I answer letters you received on irszoom.com. It's just $30 a letter, $40 a letter, or $50 a letter. Most everything there is $50 or less to answer. No retainer needed. If anyone you know has received a letter from the IRS, send them over to irszoom.com to get the answer at law. Tells the IRS, you're going to have to do better with this individual. Okay, so there you have it. We'll be back with more later.